Welcome to Pentecostal Perspectives. We're speaking from the world headquarters of the United Pentecostal Church International in St. Louis, Missouri, USA. And today's subject is biblical holiness. And I'm very happy to have with me uh, Lindsay Cressman, who's my daughter. Uh, and she is, works full time at Urshan College uh, in the administration. And her husband is a professor there. And Lindsay was born the same year that my wife and I started New Life Church of Austin, Texas. So she had the experience of growing up in a home missions environment and seeing the church grow from literally our home mm -hmm. to a congregation of about a thousand people in one of the most liberal cities of America. We have many wonderful and interesting experiences of leading people to the Lord from every background uh, seeing them baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, learning to live a holy life. Many of them had no concept of biblical holiness. So today we want to talk from a biblical perspective, what is holiness and why is it important? And from a practical perspective, what are some important areas of holiness that we should apply to our lives? So to get started, I want to read from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So here we see the importance of our horizontal relationships, peace with one another, and our vertical relationship, holiness, our relationship with God. And then there's a very strong statement that without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. So obviously it's very important to pursue holiness uh, notice it says to follow or pursue. We're not perfect, but we can be in the process. So with that introduction, uh, Lindsay, I'd like to start with you. Uh, what would, how would you define biblical holiness? What, what does holiness mean to you? Holiness to me means a separation. Um, God has called us his special people. We have experienced or are experiencing His salvation in our lives, and, and that calls us to be special, to be separate. It calls us righteous. And so in response to that, um, God outlines ways that we can honor Him, ways that we can um, imitate Him, ways that we can show the world, I am Christ's. Um, come ask me or let me tell you how I am His, what makes me His, and, and what that calls me to do in my life, whether that's um, in our speech, our lifestyle choices, our dress, so many aspects of our life, um, we can show Him. So from what I'm hearing you say, holiness covers all of our life. It's not just a matter of one thing we should do or not do, or one thing we should wear or not wear, but right. it's, it's really more our identity. Yes. Um, and of course, holiness is important. If we look at the text that I just read, um, without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Some people think of holiness as kind of a checklist. So if I do a hundred things, mm -hmm. I deserve to go to heaven. So right. if I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I wear modest clothing, I go to church every Sunday, I pay my tithes and I deserve Perfect to go to formula. heaven. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's, that's false because we're saved by grace through faith. We can't earn our salvation. We don't live holy in order to get saved. We live holy because we are saved. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean this is irrelevant. So some go the other extreme. So the one I've just described is legalism. Think you can be saved by the law. The other extreme is, well, we're not saved by the law, so we do whatever we want. But if we really love God and we really believe God's word, we'll want to follow him. And while it is God's grace working, we have to let him work. So if there's no spiritual fruit, um, there's no life of holiness. That means we're not living by faith. We're not letting God's grace work. And that does call our salvation into question because if we're not in relationship with the Lord, then, um, then we can't see the Lord, which is exactly what um, this verse says. So given that, let's get started. If we say, okay, we believe in holiness and we understand it's a separation, as you mentioned, I would also add the word dedication. So you're separated from the world, but for the purpose of being dedicated to God. So um, let's say somebody's sincere, they don't know much about the Lord, maybe they just repented or they just received the Holy Ghost. Um, what would you tell them about holiness if you, you were teaching them? What's important for, if you're gonna live a holy life, what should you be doing? Right, well, as I said before, whether you are 
um, you have experienced the fullness of the new birth or you're just getting started on the journey, you have experienced enough to know that God is wanting to work in your life, that His love is present in you. He's calling you to covenant relationship with Him. He wants you to, to be His, to be a part of this family. And so what I always encourage anyone who's getting started on their journey is, how can we respond to this invitation? How can we respond to this incredible gift? God has given us everything. How can we respond to Him? How can we show Him that we want to be in this relationship with Him? This, you know, He's extended this, what can we extend to Him? And um, I know you mentioned the list. A lot of times there's a focus on, on the exact formula that will get me that ticket to heaven. But really what I like to emphasize, especially early on, um, is what can I offer God? What do I have to offer Him now that will please Him? And what will draw me closer to Him? What are the things in my life that pull me away from Him? Um, and how can I, can I draw closer? So uh, let me give you some scripture that might help set the conversation. And then we will try to deal with some specific issues. Um, but I would say, first of all, that holiness starts with your heart, your attitude, your spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Galatians 5, through 23 talks about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. To me, this is holiness. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, it starts inside, but then it's manifested outside. Our behavior, our choices, our relationships, mm -hmm. how we treat people, our family relationships, right. all that's holiness. Yes. And then it goes to our speech, how, uh, how we communicate, mm -hmm. what we say. And of course today, that involves social media. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's, that's holiness. Um, it involves our body as the temple of the Spirit, uh, being a good steward um, in the way we treat our body and also the things we allow ourselves to do, um, the places we go. Um, it does involve our appearance and dress because that represents who we are. And that either shows that we are affirming God's plan for our lives or we're rejecting God's plans for our lives. Um, then it, it involves, um, the Bible talks a lot about your eye being the gateway to the soul, the light of the body. And so what we read, what we watch, uh, what we view online, uh, videos, uh, all of that would be related to holiness. So to me, it, it's really the whole of life. It's not a list of things, but it's who you are and who you're trying to be. And we've used this word separation, so I would like to uh, read a a passage of scripture that deals with that, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, and then beginning in verse 17, we say we, we see this emphasis on uh, separation. It says, Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you, I will be a father unto you, you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So here it's a process of developing holiness both inside and outside. And part of that is being separate, not touching unclean things. He's not talking about the dirt of the on the body. He's talking about things that are spiritually unclean. So I think we could say there's some activities that Christians shouldn't participate in or or places we shouldn't go, or things we shouldn't say, or clothes we shouldn't wear. All that is, is part of holiness. But then uh, let me read one other passage, and then I want to get to some practical areas. But Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, gives the positive side. So if we're separated from the world, that means the values of the world, then that's, it's for a higher purpose. Uh, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here we see presenting your bodies to God, presenting your whole being, including your body, uh, to the Lord as a consecration or a dedication. To me, that's holiness. So uh, let's talk about this. Uh, I know one thing that people often jump to, which we've tried not to jump to because I want to get first things first, but because it's the most visible and most different from people in the world, how does the life of holiness affect our dress or our appearance or what people see? Sure. 
Well, it's our identifiers from far away. And I know that we may have a chance to talk more about um, our modern world and, and what social media has afforded us. It's a little bit different from this, but has a lot of similarities. But the way that I dress, the way that I present myself and my speech, those are things that it's the first impression. What are people going to think that I represent based on how I'm dressing, the places that I'm going, my type of speech, how I, um, address other people, those are all indications of what I stand for, of what I'm supporting, the life I'm living. So specifically in dress, um, that is a major way that we can represent the Lord um, and modesty and different choices that we make um, that show our priority is Him, our priority is pleasing Him, not just in covering my body, but also showing modesty in another way of um, not wanting to be outlandish and drawing so much attention to myself that it distracts from the main thing I represent, which is Christ, um, not wearing such costly array that people question what my priorities are, where my resources are going. Um, and so it's, it's very important how we present ourselves tangibly, physically. So you're using the term modesty as in decently covering the body, not being lewd or lustful or mm -hmm trying to focus Atlantic on physical even. appeal, mm -hmm. but you're also talking about modesty in the sense of moderation and Correct. not trying to be extravagant. So, mm -hmm. so these would be reasons why we wouldn't have ornamental jewelry or makeup right. um, for both of those reasons, the, mm -hmm. um, trying to avoid lustful appearance, but also trying to avoid an extravagant or ostentatious mm -hmm. or gaudy appearance. Um, so uh, give me, you know, that's, that's countercultural, yes. and especially for, for girls and women. I mean, the principles apply to, to boys and men as well, mm -hmm. but I think in our Western culture, it's even more obvious um, sure. to girls and women. And so mm -hmm. growing up in school, I know you went to public school, elementary school, and then later um, a private, a private Christian school. school, but even there, it wasn't Pentecostal or apostolic. Right. Right. So you were probably made some different choices. And so um, um, tell me maybe some, how did you deal with that when people would ask you questions? Because I, I assume they did. And uh, did you feel resentment like the church was forcing this on you or the, or because your dad was a pastor? So how did you negotiate those things? Well, I actually, I'm very thankful for the diversity of experiences that I had growing up in this topic because growing up in Austin, a very liberal city, a lot of these issues that we're dealing with, especially with gender distinction, um, we were experiencing um, as I was growing up in Austin and then going to middle school and high school in a private Christian environment where you had many who were Christians, the majority were, but you also had a lot of students that were not. Maybe their parents were wanting them to seek um, a Christian education. And so you had such um, backlash in my city or such, um, I was at such a high contrast from those around me in my city, but at school I was interacting with a lot of Christians. And so their questions were um, very challenging to me because they were zealous and they were reading the word for themselves, teenagers seeking the truth. Um, and so they were applying scripture how they thought. And so I really had to wrestle with the nitty gritty of these different concepts as well as in my city, um, dealing with gender distinction and um, combating a lot of those radical liberal concepts that um, I think we're just now, the church as a whole is starting to wrestle with. So I had questions from um, peers in school about um, the small distinction between um, wearing a skirt or a dress versus maybe a pair of pants that were formed to obviously look like they were made for women. And so I had to really wrestle with those concepts for myself, which was especially important as a pastor's kid to, to carve out and to understand what, what I thought about these concepts separate from, not separate from, but independently of what I had been taught by my parents. So um, let's, let's start with an example, say from a very secular or worldly point of view. Uh, what would be some, uh, an example of maybe like a classmate's question or discussion? How, how would you deal with some of those things? Well, as I said, a major question was about pants versus skirts. And they would ask me, well, um, am I not being gender distinct in my pair of pants that maybe it has a floral design on or it's, it's 
um, made to show that it's obviously a woman's attire. And that I would um, try to answer in two ways. Number one, often when pants are made for women, they're intended to form to be form-fitting to the figure, which then would make it immodest. Um, but I also would respond that we're trying to address our culture and what is widely accepted. You know, scripture talks about what is um, right for what it pertains to the man, what pertains to the woman. And for, you know, many, many years, our culture has continued and still does, even in our time where there's such um, gender fluidity in our secular culture that the the symbol of the dress, the symbol of the skirt is what immediately indicates femininity. When someone is wanting to be their most feminine, this is what they embody. And I would try to answer in those ways and, and the same for men. Um, and I remember having a conversation with a, a classmate and I, I told him, I said, you know, unfortunately I do see our world going in the direction as the Lord, as it, time comes to where he's, we know he's coming sooner rather than later, there'll be a time where we do see men in skirts, that that will be a norm, that will be a common um, instance. And he just really balked at that and said, there's no way that that will ever happen. And so your, your conversation really isn't, isn't valid, it's not relevant. And I brought him a newspaper clipping the very next week of, uh, with a picture of, of a man wearing a skirt in downtown Austin. And of course the newspaper, the, the writer was just really uh, applauding this courage and you know this is a step in the right direction for freedom and for all of these points which of course now these are conversations that are increasingly familiar to us and so you know that's that's interesting because if you go back to the word of god in, in genesis before there ever was sin in the human race god created male and female now male and female are comparable companions we're equal in god's sight but we're different we have different roles and so the physical appearance is different. Um, women are biologically suited to bearing children and, and nurturing young children in a way that men are not. And so there is a, a distinction. And then God expected that distinction to be carried out throughout every human society. So we see in Deuteronomy uh, 22.5, under the Old Testament law, that men were not to wear clothing uh, that were pertain to women and women were, are not to wear clothing to pertain to men. So there's a principle. And while different cultures have different forms of dress, and some of them might be different from our Western clothing, in every culture, God's plan is for women to have some things that distinguish them as women and men to have some things that distinguish them as men. And that's a principle not only in the Old Testament, but the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about men cutting their hair short, uh, women letting their hair grow long as a as another visible mm -hmm. distinction and as a natural distinction and it's a natural distinction um, and and I would point out uh, I think there's uh, it's a val valid point that men are ten times more likely to grow bald than women because of it's related to their home hormones and uh, their genetics and I think that's nature's way of saying if a man doesn't have hair that's just considered very typical very normal if a woman doesn't have any hair. Well, that indicates there's something unusual or abnormal. Um, but the point is, throughout the Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, you find this visible distinction between male and female. And you've lived to see in your lifetime how much more in mine how culture has shifted. So my, my mother tells me she remembered a time when it was highly unusual for a woman to wear pants in public. And when they started wearing pants, it was for work. Uh, as a result of World War II, men going off to war, women going to the factories, and there was, and there was criticism. Limited. But it was mainly limited to work or sports or casual occasions. Uh, she remembers when a woman was arrested on the street for wearing shorts right. because that was immodest. So that was a change in her generation. My generation, it was very common for women to wear pants, increasingly for social and occasions. Um, but not for men, of course. And uh, homosexuality was clearly seen as, um, for the vast majority of people, uh, not appropriate, not proper. Um, and even when people begin saying, well, let's make sure everyone has civil rights, including those who are homosexual, but still when it comes to marriage, there's a difference. Uh, but we've seen 
your generation has seen the elimination of this barrier of same-sex marriage and also the gender fluidity where even when dress was fluid, the distinction of male and female was locked in. But now what started with dress is now identity. Um, And I think that's no coincidence uh, because when you eliminate all all visible distinctions, you eventually attack the distinction itself. And I think that's where our culture is, has gone. Uh, what about, it's, I, I brought up the subject of, of hair, ladies and women having long hair. I'm sure you probably had some questions like that as well at school, whether it be from a, a, a denominational Christian or from just an, a person who's secular who's not a Christian. Mm-hmm. Do you have any experiences or examples that you could share? Absolutely. I often had questions and Uh, The second question was always, not even a trim? No, not even a trim. And and that actually opened doors for healthy conversations, in my opinion, um, because there was a a thought that if you trim it, that was keeping it more healthy. And I was able to to dialogue about um, how I was keeping my hair healthy, the different strategies, um, which is a different topic, of course. But I was able to be a witness of that, that I am caring for my temple and I am doing something that I believe is pleasing to the Lord. And so um, it always evolved into a conversation of what more can I give God? That was always the direction that I tried to steer the conversation was, if there's more that I can give Him, if He's done everything for me, why can't, why wouldn't I give more? And so um, they were always intrigued about why not a trim. And I also really enjoyed talking with different women, different girls in my high school that had different types of hair and how it would grow. And so we were able to have conversations about um, that we try not to shame those who are unable to grow the very long hair that some are able to grow, um, different hair textures and styles. And so um, it shouldn't be a topic that we shy away from because um, we've established this expectation that if you are um, representing holiness in your uncut hair, it has to be down to your thigh or to your knee but these are the different ways it can be represented. I think that opened doors, especially in my school, because if they knew anything of the Pentecostal standards of holiness, they did have that strict guideline in mind. And I was trying to open the door to say, these are all the different ways that we can please God and who we already are naturally. So in other words, the the key point is the distinction between male and female. So we're not trying to measure how long it grows, just let it grow naturally. So different races, different individuals, their hair might be different, but it still can be feminine, long, um, and can please God. Um, It's not all about looking uh, identical, so to speak, because God has created us in our diversity. And that diversity is a good thing as long as we're following uh, godly principles. Um, I noticed that you also related a couple times to social media. So I get the impression that you think Christians should be different on social media than worldly people. Absolutely. I, I try to regularly ask myself, how can I be separate from today's secular culture? What, what is going on in society and how can I respond to that? How can I um, present myself in high contrast to the world around me that is increasingly amoral. And I see ourselves, the church, we are experiencing, well, really the same things we've been experiencing, but they're rapidly evolving and advancing. And I see an excellent opportunity for the church to demonstrate our holiness, demonstrate our separateness, demonstrate our consecration in the way that we treat other people on social media because Um, such large portions of our lives now are spent on social media where we engage with individuals that may never see more of us than a profile picture or a a picture we post every now and then of ourselves, our family members. And so what an opportunity in our speech, in what we choose to build up, what we choose to tear down, to be separate, to be different from the world around us. And um, I get a little bit of of fire um, because I see those that are not... um, that are not following Christ, but are becoming those uh, forerunners of promoting, let's have good dialogue, let's have healthy dialogue, let's come together as a country. Um, and I want the church to take advantage of that opportunity. I, um, if you don't mind, I was brought back to Ephesians 4, and uh, Paul contrasts the saved and the unsaved. 
And it just reminded me of the beautiful ways that, especially on social media, we can be separate. We can um, represent Christ. Our tangible lifestyle cho choices distinguish us as gods. And we live in a time that's offered us an excellent opportunity to display our holiness in other ways. And Ephesians 4, behaviors like telling the truth, controlling our anger, doing honest work, refraining from discussion that does not build up, being kind, tender-hearted, forgiving to others. Um, these are the, the things that we can live out every single day on social media. What we choose to start, what we choose to finish, what we choose to share, especially. Um, I, I know we can be over, overly concerned to a point that it hinders us, but I think we should give more attention um, than ever to these things. You know, it's something interesting. Uh, uh, this is about society in general, but there's something about technology that when people are, are in the privacy of their home or on their computer or their uh, smartphone uh, and they're not with other people, there's not the same psychological or spiritual barriers. And so they'll say and do things in that form as if they're anonymous even though they're not anonymous. And, is, and if there's nobody else that they're interacting with, when obviously they're interacting with people. So I see that even among Pentecostals. One, one example might be people sharing things from the privacy of their home, their backyard, their bedroom, their vacation, which you really wouldn't present in public. Right. And while it might be appropriate in private or with your family, it's not appropriate for the general public. So uh, things like modesty, to some extent, depend on your situation. Right. So if it's a group of girls together versus mixed company, mm -hmm. um, or if it's your immediate family versus the general public or going to church. But some people seem to have lost that distinction between public and private, which I think we still need to maintain. Mm -hmm. Or maybe for some, it's just being a consistent Christian wherever you go. Um, not, and then, but also what I see among Pentecostals is that in our interaction, sometimes we can be very harsh, even hateful, mm -hmm. say things to demean or disparage or to uh, attack um, because we're so zealous on proving our point, whether it's a political point or social point or maybe even a theological point. And here we're attacking people, we're demeaning people, we're ridiculing people and even crossing into what I would consider vulgar or offensive speech. Um, I don't understand how Christians can be inconsistent, but maybe that's something we all need to work on. But then maybe there's a bigger picture of how you present yourself. Um, so can you talk for a minute, young people, uh, like you work with, with college students. So how do they present themselves on social media and are they just buying into the culture? What can they do to not buy into the culture? I, it's a danger, it's a temptation. Uh, so much of what we do, and especially speaking about this you know, hyphen age, the young adult age, it, it happens um, unintentionally because often we're, we're carried with the culture. And so um, it can be so easy to um, be presenting ourselves in a way that uh, we think we're fighting for this, um, this certain discussion. We're, we're trying to make the point and we're wanting to be zealous. We're wanting to fight the good fight online. And what I am always trying to challenge myself and challenge anyone I can, can speak to, especially at Urshan, our young adults, is to change the motivation for our holiness, change the motivation for our righteousness. It's to glorify God, but at the end of the day, um, we're called to change our world. We're called to bring someone else into this family, into this body of Christ. And so, yes, you could win the argument, Yes, you could prove your theological understandings, you could prove your zeal for God, but is it destroying a personal relationship with someone that you could, um, or closing a door that could have opened um, their chance to, to know God, their chance to feel love for the very first time, um, and maybe you've won the argument, but have they felt God's love? Are they any more open to being in a personal covenantal relationship with God? The answer is often no. And so what I encourage our young people is, um, let's shift our focus. Let's shift our hearts and our motives. What can I do today that someone else will see, someone else will hear, that will want to want, that will cause them to want to draw closer to God? Now, 
I've heard you mention this before, but it seems like one of the problems of social media is trying to create a good impression, which yes. is often a, a false impression or a happy life, which, which that's not bad. But it looks like young people and really all of us try to create uh, almost a fake persona of we're perfect. And then that leads other people to see, wow, Lindsay has a perfect life and this family has a perfect family and they have a perfect marriage and they're always going to fancy restaurants and eating wonderful meals and wearing wonderful clothes. What's wrong with me? So what would you tell particularly young adults? Um, should you just ignore all that and get off social media or should you just go ahead and m- m- put your best face forward so you can represent God well? This what do you This do? is a battle in my mind. This is something that my husband and I are constantly dialoguing about, especially because we both work at Urshan. I think it's a balance and it is a challenge. I, I do understand the challenge. We won't always get it right and we, we're still navigating a lot. Our world is changing so quickly. Technology is changing so quickly. But what I encourage our young people to do is find a balance because there is a, um, a way to be real There's a way to share your real life. We all go through struggles, trials. We're all pushed to our limits. We all have bad days. Um, And we all have days where we don't look like you and I just prepared for this this Facebook Live video. We've done some prepping. Um, So we're we're doing our very best today, but um, maybe tomorrow's a day off and we get to relax at home. We don't look like we're looking today. It's okay to show that, but I also encourage our young people not to be so consumed by a very popular trend in our culture of oversharing. And I think that touches on, um, and I don't wanna get back into it too much, but I think that touches on modesty. And so we wanna try to find the balance. And again, I know that it is a challenge, but it's a challenge that's worth pursuing because we can show I have a real life that I am I'm needing God's forgiveness. I'm needing his mercy, his strength every single day. But I also can show that I'm living an overcoming life. You can do this. I I wanna show my family that I love, but I also wanna be sensitive um, to someone that maybe doesn't have a family that I can can post. I'm thankful because God gave me this family. So the word I picked out of that is balance. So on the one hand, um, we shouldn't pretend that we're perfect. We should be vulnerable. We can say, I have trials too. I have temptations too. But then we don't need to go into the gory details of our failures. Uh, We need to say, but but I am able to live a holy life by God's grace. I'm a person just like you. I have things I enjoy and I have things I don't enjoy. Uh, I have struggles, but but at the end of the day, we can all live for God. Um, And then I want to pick up on something you said earlier that as far as our motivation for holiness, um, the legalistic mindset is more or less, what can I get by with? What I have to do to be saved? which that's a wrong approach to start with because we're saved by grace through faith. So it's we better focus on our relation with God if we're truly interested in being saved. But what do I have to do to be a member of the church or to sing in the choir or to do this? But you mentioned something like, what can I give to God? So it sounds like your approach is not, what can I get away with or what I have to do, but more, how can I glorify God or how can I please God? Absolutely. Um, And I, I think, again, it goes back to shifting our our entire worldview. What is my motivation? Is my motivation for this life to gain as much as I can, to please myself as much as I can, or is my motivation to glorify God as much as I can for the time I have and to lead as many people as I can to Him? And if we truly allow that worldview to change our everyday decisions, then those those small things, a legalistic uh, view, the list, really fades away Mm -hmm. because I'm no longer asking, what can I get by with? I'm no longer asking, is this a heaven or hell issue? I'm asking, God, what can I give you today? And considering the fact that he gave me everything, um, my hair, the the outfit I'm wearing today, it really doesn't matter to me, especially if it means a soul. So I think probably what we're saying is a lot of things that we might call difficult questions of holiness or um, but they become easy when you change the conversation. So can you prove that if I do this one thing, I go to hell? Can you prove that I don't I don't have the right to do this one thing? Um, We could argue endlessly. If I smoke one cigarette, am I going to hell? If I drink one beer, I'm going to hell. If I trim off a half inch uh, of hair, 
or uh, if I'm going to hell, well, if not, well, what about one inch? And if right. not, what, you know, if I wear a, a skirt that's a half inch shorter than the pastor says, I'm going to hell. Well, if not, what if I do it one inch, two inch, three inch? So you, you can have endless discussions, but if you change the question to what pleases God, what do I think God really wants me to do? What's best for myself, my own emotional and spiritual life? What's best for my Christian witness? What's best for my children or what's best for my peers or what's best for the, 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 the people living a sinful life that I'm trying to influence? What's most likely uh, to represent God? And when you start it from that perspective, a lot of these questions are pretty easy or as you say, it's no big deal. I'm happy to do whatever God wants or whatever the Bible says or what, whatever um, our consensus as a church of studying God's word says is the best way. I'm really fine with that because this isn't a big deal for me. And if it can make a difference for someone, then it's worthwhile. Well, uh, let me summarize. We're going to close in prayer. But if you're interested in more discussion, I have written several books. Uh, years ago, my, my mom and I wrote kind of an introductory practical book called In Search of Holiness. That's still a very popular book. And then I followed up with a second one called Practical Holiness, which gives a little bit more of the theory behind it or the theology behind it and talks about legalism, Christian liberty, and so on. And so those are two, two standard books. So if, you, if you're not wanting the big book uh, or, or the, a full book, but you want two of those combined, uh, we condense them and combine them in something called Pursuing Holiness. That also has um, a small group study guide with some short videos that can be used um, in, in small group settings. Um, and then I also taped uh, several video lessons that are on DVD called The Life of Holiness. I think that's three lessons. It's for a general audience. And then finally, there's just a little booklet called Essentials of Holiness. So you can go all the way from just a short booklet to... Uh, some video instruction to, to the full books. All those are available at the Pentecostal Publishing House at PentecostalPublishing.com. Uh, any final thoughts or words? No, I just want to encourage um, us to follow everything that we're talking about today and to um, be challenged rather than find condemnation every day, whether you're at the very beginning of this journey or you've lived for the Lord for many years. There's always a way we can be challenged there's always more we can give Him, and I would encourage us all to do that and ask ourselves that today. So let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for the beautiful privilege of salvation, for what the Bible says is the beauty of holiness, the privilege to walk with You and have fellowship with You and be transformed into Your image. Lord, help all of us to continue our pursuit of holiness, whether we're brand new in serving the Lord or whether we've served the Lord for many years. Help us to continue to grow to develop, uh, not to be self-righteous or judgmental, but to be hungry for more of you. Help us to pursue your holiness until you come for your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.